Next on AM 1480 WLEA, the Newsmaker Show. Here's Ryan O'Neill. The doctor is in. Dr. Gary Ostra, our longtime Alfred University history professor, and uh, he's on the line with us this morning. Dr. Ostar, thanks for calling in. Hey, thanks for having me here. But when you call me a doctor, I hope that people aren't going to call me about the coronavirus. Uh, my doctorate is not exactly in the area of uh, respiration and pulmonary issues. Let's start out with that. And what do you make of the uh, what's being described by some as uh, panic shopping with the stores uh in many cases, uh, not having, and I'm not talking about around here so much, but talking about uh, the report this morning out of Rochester that Costco's out of toilet paper, and there's a lot of stories like that. Well, look, I think there's plenty to be concerned about. Uh, whether it should lead to panic buying and whatnot, uh, I would hope not. Uh, we really need to keep this whole thing in perspective, and there have been a number of uh, broadcasts that I've heard, probably the best. Uh, was a one-hour broadcast on CNN back on Tuesday with Sanjay Gupta and a number of other doctors and epidemiologists who are saying, yeah, there is plenty to be concerned about, but, you know, one must keep this in perspective. It's not as if, uh, you know, we're being overrun. This is not Wuhan, China right now. Uh, but the um, uh, but keeping it in perspective means uh, also basing our own actions on the basis of truth. And, you know, people on this program have heard me complain about the president and about the degree to which, uh, you know, he rarely, and I mean rarely, tells the truth about things. And he has some responsibility here. I mean, I'm thinking of some of the things that President Trump has said just recently, uh, where, you know, he made the point, for instance, and I'm going to quote him here, we have it, meaning the virus, we have it under control, it's going to be just fine. And then he said, by April, you know, in theory, when it gets a little warmer, it miraculously goes away. He blames the Obama administration for making decisions on testing that turned out to be detrimental to what we're, what we're doing. And I might add, Brian, that that is absolutely untrue. But he also goes on to say that we're going very substantially down, not up. We have it so well under control. I mean, we really have done a very good job. And, you know, I could go on with these statements that President Trump made that turn out to be simply incorrect. You know, he talks that, you know, he says that he has a hunch that everything will be okay. Well, when you're the President of the United States, I don't think we should be hearing about his hunches. I think what the President should be saying is we're going to turn this over to our experts at the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta and at the NIH, the National Institutes for Health, where Anthony Fauci is really a top-notch administrator. There are people who do know what they're talking about. And unless we get straight information, it is going to lead to confusion, and that confusion is going to contribute to the very thing that you're referring to, namely public panic. Uh, reports out this morning, uh, and I'm reading from CNBC here, that uh, the Chinese foreign ministry spokesperson is saying it's highly irresponsible for some in the media to dub it the China virus. And the story goes on to say that, uh, that uh, some in China are saying that, it, it, that the vir there's no proof that the virus came from China. What do you make of that story, Gary? Well, I think there's plenty of uh, plenty of proof that the virus came from China. Uh, you know, there are historical precedents here also. Uh, they used to call the, well, in 1918, 1919, we had a terrible, terrible case of the flu here, a case of the flu in which over 50 million people died worldwide. 750,000 Americans died of the flu uh, in, 19, uh, in 1918. We call that flu the Spanish flu. And we called it the Spanish flu because there were rumors, and it turned out, I should think, to be untrue. But it turned out that, uh, 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 you know, there were French in 1918. Remember, this the war, the First World War was still going on. Uh, the French argued that it came from Spain. And so the Spanish got you know, tagged with this, uh, with this responsibility. In the case of the uh, coronavirus, uh, it would appear that it did indeed come from a market, from a food market in, uh, in Wuhan. But 
you know, that's uh, uh, it's a political thing. If you want to call it the Chinese flu, you call it the Chinese flu. If the Chinese want to call it something else, that's fine. I don't care what we call it. What I do want is that there be, you know, accurate information. And one of the things we're not getting in the U.S. right now is a lot of accurate information. This morning I heard that there were up to 700 Americans who now are confirmed at having the coronavirus. Well, that may be true. Uh, that there are confirmed cases, but there are almost certainly many additional cases. And again, without wanting to, uh, uh, you know, to contribute to any kind of a, a public, uh, a public fear, you know, ex- excessive anxiety. The reason we say there are 700 cases is because there are those people who have been tested, who have, you know, who have these confirmed cases. How many people have been tested? As of yesterday, there had been 4,800 Americans who were tested. And that's not a very, very large number. We simply do not have the number of test kits. We do not have the ability, in other words, to test the number of Americans that we should. At this stage of the crisis, in England, 24,000 people had been tested. At this stage of the crisis in South Korea, over 100,000 had been tested. Uh, So, you know, we are really way, way behind the eight ball. And one of the reasons we're behind the eight ball is because... The White House has not taken it very seriously. We should have been gearing up six, seven, eight weeks ago to make sure that that communities, that uh, hospitals, that health, public health agencies, and so forth are going to have enough uh, enough of these test kits. And uh, I would just say that you know I was listening to Gordon Deal on the news just before this program, and he made the point that public health agencies have been starved for funds, and therefore they are not in a position to do today what you know they really should be if we are going to be fully protected. So, uh, you know, we're kind of starting late on this whole thing. Talking to Dr. Gary Ostrar, before we move on to the uh, Democratic uh, race for the White House, wanted to ask you, what did, would you think under the circumstances of completely closing the border uh, in terms of uh, no planes uh, coming in and no planes going out, uh, you know, talking about especially the countries uh, which are you know, I'm very contaminated with the uh, coronavirus, places like uh, Italy and China. Uh, you know, maybe you wouldn't have to do it for every country, but what would you think of an idea like that on a temporary basis, Gary? Well, I think it, it's worth considering. And I think that, you know, for all of my criticism of the Trump administration, I think they've been very, very lax and very, very tardy in the way in which they responded to this. One of the things I think that they did right was to essentially halt immigration, uh, uh, you know, contact from China itself. Uh, uh, should we do that from Italy? Well, I think the Italians may do it themselves at this point. And I might add, uh, airlines are no longer, some airlines are no longer flying into Italy as they are no longer flying into, uh, uh, into China. So uh, it's a drastic measure, and it may have very, very serious economic consequences. On the same, by the same token, it's likely to save lives. So, you know, I, 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 I'm not familiar enough. I'm not an expert in this field. I'm not familiar enough with, you know, some of the consequences, but I certainly think that kind of thing should be on the table. I don't think that, look, we're in uncharted waters, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, we've, we've had quarantines before. They haven't worked out, uh, you know, all that well. Back in the 1884, 1885, uh, there was an outbreak of some kind of disease. I don't know what it was uh, in Muncie, Indiana. Well, they quarantined Muncie, Indiana back in that period, and it led to rioting. It led to a good deal of violence. Uh, you know, we've got to be very, very careful about the way in which we respond to these public health emergencies. But the notion of, you know, I think that the Chinese, by more or less closing down not only Wuhan, but closing down, locking down many Many other Chinese cities apparently has reduced, if not eliminated, but certainly reduced the spread in China. And we may be in a position where we're going to have to do the same thing. I think you're probably aware that there are 21 colleges and universities in the United States that have already announced uh, that they are not going to resume classes next week when the spring break is over. Uh, there are companies, my, my son-in-law's company, for instance, which is an international corporation, they employ about four. 4,400 people worldwide has told all of their employees, 
do not come into work for the next six, six weeks. In other words, they're trying to limit the amount of uh, you know, contact that people have with other people. I was supposed to go down to see uh, St. Bonaventure in the Atlantic 10 Conference Championship uh, in the Barclays Center at the end of this week, uh, and I am not going to go to that game. I think it's important, in other words, that we limit, uh, that, we limit that contact. At my tender age, I do not intend to be in uh, groups of, you know, with large numbers of other people. So, you know, that's a little bit different from the issue that you're talking about, respect, restricting all contact with some of these countries, with some of these other countries. Uh, but I think that everything has to be on the table at this point. Talking to uh, Alfred University history professor, Dr. Gary Ostrauer. Uh, Dr. Ostrauer, moving on to the uh, race for the White House on the Democrat side, uh, looking at realclearpolitics.com, looking at the polls in Michigan today. Uh, Joe Biden is ahead of uh, Bernie Sanders by 21 points. And as you look uh, down the uh, the, uh, the polls from uh, yesterday, uh, has Biden uh, had 15 points in the same state, uh, Michigan, uh, just yesterday. In Mississippi, Biden 55 points ahead of uh, Bernie Sanders. What do you make of the current uh, situation with the Democrats? I think that what happened in South Carolina and what happened on Super Tuesday a week ago today uh, is stunning. Uh, we have rarely seen a political turnaround the way we did over the last, uh, uh, you know, 14 days. Uh, when I say a turnaround, I'm talking about a guy uh, who is dead, <laughs> politically dead. I'm talking about Joe Biden, uh, who is now the front runner. And it happened in a remarkably fast uh, period. I can't remember. I mean, as a historian, I'm trying to think back, you know, when has someone, in a sense, uh, uh, you know, resurrected himself this way? And I can't think of any other examples of that. So, uh, uh, I, and I also think, and to respond directly to what you're raising here, that if, in fact, Biden defeats Sanders by 20 points in Michigan, Sanders' campaign is effectively over. Now, Bernie Sanders is a smart guy, and Bernie Sanders is a very, very effective uh, politician in his own way, and he's a very, very stubborn guy. He's someone who, you know, has a message, and he wants to get that message out as well as, you know, win the presidency for himself. But I would think that even, even Bernie Sanders might understand that if he can't win in Michigan, which is a working class state, uh, he's not going to, uh, he's not going to make it. Uh, the, uh, uh, there is an element of the Sanders campaign, though, that I think we're going to hear a good deal more about. Bernie Sanders has staked a fair amount of his credibility on the idea that we need, quote, Medicare for all. You know, Elizabeth Warren was saying the same thing, but Bernie, more than anyone else, has been the, argue, you know, has been the guy arguing for Medicare for all. Uh, and I think that we're going to hear more about that for this reason. I'm going to connect it, if I may, to what we were talking about earlier. With the coronavirus, okay, it's important that people be tested. But if that individuals do not have insurance, if people are simply too poor to afford the kind of health care that they need, and they're carrying that virus, they're going to spread it. Others are going to be affected by it. In other words, it's going to contribute to a national contagion. And if they do have Medicare for all, presumably they would have the ability to be tested. In other words, Medicare for all, in a funny way, protects all of us, not only, not only that small number of people who would lack medical insurance. Be it as it may, I think that, uh, you know, Sanders has an uphill battle, and if he loses today, and not so much in Mississippi, because we can expect that uh, a state where you have a large African-American population is going to go for Biden. But if he loses in, a, in a, a Michigan, as I said, I think it's all over for Sanders. We're going to continue our conversation with uh, Alfred University history professor Dr. Gary Ostrauer in just a moment. When we come back, we'll talk about the latest out of Afghanistan and this day in history. Dad, I need to get my corporate taxes done. Can you take me to Cunningham Starring and Associates? Corporate taxes? You have a corporation? Yes, I opened it to get checks for my YouTube channel. YouTube channel? Yes, I have a YouTube channel. Now can you take me to Cunningham Starring and Associates? They are due on March 16th, and my personal return is due on April 15th. Take you where? To Cunningham Starring and Associates at 91 Washington Street in Hornell, on the corner of Thatcher and Washington Street, or find them online at hornelltax.com. 
Checking in now with uh, meteorologist Rob Carolyn. Rob, what are your meteorologic observations for the day? Well, a little bit of rain out there this morning, Brian. That should taper off later this afternoon. The mild weather is going to be coming to an end today. We're going to cool off uh, about 10 degrees into tomorrow. We'll warm it back up on Thursday and then cool it back down starting on Friday and through the weekend. As we continue to see this pattern between spring to the south and winter to the north. A lot of cloudiness out there. It's breezy. We've got a cold front headed our way, Brian. That's why we'll see the rain through the morning. Tapers off this afternoon. Temperatures are about 55 to 60. Sun came up this morning. Now that we're into daylight savings time at 728, it'll set tonight at 712. We have partial clearing in the forecast for the overnight, turning colder, 25 to 30. For tomorrow, look for sunshine in the morning. Clouds increase through the afternoon. Could have a late day shower. Cooler tomorrow. It's only 45 to 50. Tomorrow night, chance of a couple of rain showers. Lows 30 to 35. Showers, they're still around on Thursday, Brian. It's a little bit warmer, though. Highs will be 50 to 55. Back with Alfred University history professor Dr. Gary Ostrar reading the headlines this morning on Afghanistan. It says on uh, the BBC, U.S. begins withdrawing troops from USA Today. U.S. starts pulling troops from Afghanistan as part of a peace deal with the Taliban. Gary, your thoughts? It's been a long war, and I think that uh, most Americans are tired of it. Most Americans are relatively uninformed about, you know, what's happening in Afghanistan. Uh, this is a peace deal between the United States and the Taliban, not between the Afghan government and the Taliban. We are essentially abandoning our Afghan allies in much the same way that some great powers have abandoned small powers uh, at other times in history, such as at Munich in 1938, when the British and the French abandoned their, uh, their Czech allies. Uh, I think this leaves Afghan women in a very, very vulnerable position. What it really means, in other words, is that the U.S. cuts its own losses uh, in, Af uh, in Afghanistan. And the other point I would want to make about this, and why I'm so uneasy about what, what's happening, is that the, uh, uh, there has no, I think there's no evidence, and I really mean no evidence, that the Taliban are going to uh, keep their promises, that the Taliban, in other words, are going to essentially cease their own operations uh, in, uh, in Afghanistan. I think what's going to happen in Afghanistan is what happened in Vietnam. In Vietnam, the U.S. and the North Vietnamese government concluded an agreement in uh, January of 1973 that allowed the Americans to pull out their remaining troops. Uh, two years later, the entire country uh, became uh, a communist country. It fell, in other words, to Ho Chi Minh when he resumed the war, but it resumed the war after the U.S. had left, resumed the war after he knew very, very well that the U.S., that is to say, that President Ford at that time was not going to reintroduce troops into uh, the country in order to save, if you will, to preserve the government of South Vietnam. Uh, I don't think that there is any reason whatsoever that we should trust the promises that the Taliban are making. They have, uh, they have, uh, uh, they have broken promises before, and I have uh, every reason to believe that they will break those promises again. Talking to Dr. Gary Ostrower, now uh, moving on to uh, this day in history, March 10th, 1945. 300 American bombers continue to drop almost 2,000 tons of incendiaries on Tokyo, Japan, in a mission that launched the previous day, March 9, 1945. This attack, March 10, destroyed large por portions of the Japanese capital and killed 100,000 civilians. Now, this was, what, three or four months, uh, Dr. Ostrar, before Hiroshima and Nagasaki? That's correct. About five months. The war finally ends. The uh, attack on Hiroshima was on August 6th, uh, on Nagasaki on August 9th, and this, of course, was in March. So, you know, roughly speaking, uh, you can do the math there. But it was these the, the, the planes that dropped those bombs were B-29s. They were developed during the war. It became the heaviest bomber that the U.S. used during the war. And I think it's worth adding that, yeah, while Tokyo was destroyed by incendiary bombs, killing, as you mentioned, 100,000 civilians, that's probably more than the number of civilians who were killed in the first atomic bombing of Hiroshima, Tokyo was hardly the only city that was going to be subject to these kinds of attacks. There are about 60 major Japanese cities 
back in that period. Major, in other words, meaning industrial centers or industrial centers with military bases. And about 54 of those cities were pretty much obliterated. And remember, back in that period, you did not have in Japan, uh, you know, many stone structures, many of the houses, many of the buildings were wooden, and so they were so much more vulnerable to incendiary bombs. Uh, 54 of those cities were destroyed. Japan, for all intents and purposes, by the time of uh, Hiroshima, was a defeated was a defeated power. Uh, the government had not admitted that, uh, but uh, uh, the, that was in fact uh, that was in fact the case. And I might add too that the Japanese Navy had been destroyed, so they couldn't bring their troops from China back to defend Japan. Uh, the Japanese Air Force had been destroyed. The only planes they really had left were these kamikaze planes that I'm sure most of our listeners have heard about. So uh, you know, Japan was in a very very weakened state. And I want to mention one more thing about that. Uh, that, that uh, incendiary bombing. There were five, or actually six cities that were not bombed. And the reason they were not destroyed was because the U.S. War Department, led by Henry Stimson, at that time Henry Stimson was our Secretary of War. Today we call him the Secretary of Defense. Uh, uh, the U.S. Uh, War Department was preserving those six cities for atomic bombings. And the idea was that if we bombed a city, if we dropped an A-bomb on a city that had already been destroyed, the effect of that uh, of, of the atomic bomb would be muted. The effect, in other words, wouldn't be as dramatic as if the city, in fact, had not been destroyed at all. Uh, eventually, one of those six cities, Kyoto, was removed from that list. And, of course, two of them included uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Dr. Ostar, we have about uh, 45 seconds left. Um, was Japan... Japan was allies... Uh, uh, with um, Italy and obviously Nazi Germany. How much was Japan into Nazism as well? Well, that's a good question. I mean, historians kind of uh, you know, argue about that a little bit. As a, you know, in terms of a diplomatic wartime alliance, very, very closely uh, connected. Uh, but if you're asking, you know, did Japan have a Nazi government, the answer is I would say, not Nazi in quite exactly the same way that Hitler is going to define it, but a fascist government, much more similar, if you will, to what existed in uh, in Italy, a government which emphasized uh, the glories of uh, you know Japan's past, uh, xenophobic, in other words, extreme nationalism, militarism, imperialism. Japan had spread its empire over the entire area of East Asia. Uh, and not only East Asia, but even south of that into the Dutch East Indies and whatnot. So, yeah, I think that the parallels with what was going on with European fascism are pretty, uh, are pretty striking. With that, we have to leave it. As always, it's great having you on, Dr. Ostrauer. Well, thank you very much for having me on. I'll talk to you guys next week.